Okay, I just hit start on the webinar, um, and just in case, I'm going to restart on the title slide, folks. Uh, good afternoon from Washington, D.C. area, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Jeff Price, and I'm a transportation specialist and project manager for the Curbside Research in FHWA's Office of Human Environment. Welcome to the Curbside Management webinar. We're scheduled to run today for the entire the hour up till 2 p.m. First, some housekeeping tips. The webinar room capacity is for 250 participants. Uh, looks like we're doing okay for capacity, so welcome all. The presentation slides are available in the chat pod, as are links to the FHWA curbside report and the ITE curbside resources. Please avail yourself of that. Um, the participant microphones are being turned off and you're being put in as a participant mode. So please uh, focus on using the chat pod for asking questions, okay? Uh, the webinar will be recorded today, as I just mentioned, and uh, we are um, turning on the closed captioning for the recording. For closed captioning for your viewing today, uh, for MS Teams, please go to the top actions bar at the top of your screen and click on more actions tab where you see the three dots. From there, you can scroll down and click on the turn on live captioning. That will get you the captioning. I'm now going to um, start with the webinar agenda. Let's review what we're going to discuss today. First, we will hear an introduction and context setting from Sherry Schaffline from the Federal Highway's Office of Planning, Environment, and Realty. Second, we'll hear more perspectives from FHWA from Tomiko Burnell, transportation specialist from the FHWA's Office of Freight. Then we will hear a summary of the curbside inventory report from the principal investigator, Sarah Abel, who's the transportation planning director at the ITE Institute for Transportation Engineers. Then I will provide some lessons learned from the research and the report, and we'll go to next steps. We'll then conclude today's hour long webinar with a Q&A to hear your questions. OK, Sherry, take it away. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, let me uh, continue the introduction and provide a little bit of context what we're going to cover today. Our curbside research finds that the practice of curbside management is a quickly evolving space. Since ITE's initial publication of the Curbside Management Practitioner's Guide in late 2018, the demand for curb space across the United States has only continued to increase and diversify. Uh, one reason for this- Gary, can you turn your um, camera on, please? It is on. Okay, thanks. Uh, one reason for this is that the new modes have been introduced and more transportation providers are offering services which need to be regulated by local agencies. Our research shows that agencies have found innovative strategies and technologies to inventory and manage use of curb space. Uh, the FHWA research agenda includes advancing multimodal innovation and new mobility and both of these areas are addressed in curbside management practices uh, that we want to highlight. Our research highlights how local agency decision making has prioritized uh, curbside treatments and projects that improve the operation of shared systems that include transit, freight, pedestrian, and bicycle networks. This research highlights data-driven practices from areas around the country in a format that can be used by all transportation pract practitioners and for communities of all sizes. This research identifies the process and data needed to conduct better operations, but also focuses on better project planning at the local level. Local data-driven informed decisions can also flow up to the MPO and to adjacent jurisdictions informing metropolitan and statewide uh, plans. For example, local jurisdictions may share approaches to micromobility service agreements and data collection. Conversely, some regional significant projects, such as bus rapid transit or light rail projects, are vetted and improved at the transit agency and MPO level, 
but these projects get implemented over multiple local uh, agencies and they have to conform to the local street designs and curbside regulations of each jurisdiction. The data-driven data process is a key component of project implementation. Innovation has been demonstrated in managing mobility trends, including last mile freight delivery, autonomous vehicles and transportation network companies with variable fleets of vehicles and mobility devices. The increasing number of protected bike, bike lanes is bringing more bicyclists that feel more comfortable. That comfort will be impacted if sight lines are uh, influenced by park trucks or random drop offs and pickups uh, have people crossing the bike lane at mid block. Curbside management approaches have also been used in urban placemaking to facilitate activities such as food trucks, parklets, farmers markets, and overall vibrant street retail activity. Some of the curbside management practices and information can be useful for addressing recent temporary closure and post-pandemic recovery operations. However, this research was implemented before the pandemic and does not specifically address what occurred during 2020 and 2021. Next slide, Jeff. So the Federal Highway Overall Office of Planning, Environment and Realty are supporting our local and state partners and are elevating awareness and resources through the recent Public Roads Magazine Hot Topic article on managing curbside productivity. We're partnering today with ITE on this research webinar and hope to continue partnering with many others. Curbside management intersects with a variety of human environment interests. In particular, a variety of federal aid programs have funded the building of bicycle and pedestrian networks. Significant progress has been made in trying to reduce conflicts between modes and users and support complete trips for persons with disabilities. The full safety and mobility benefits of those investments rest on thoughtful planning for freight and passenger pickup and drop off zones. Mobility innovation that includes shared micro mobility, such as scooters and e-bikes, whether privately owned or in a shared system, are increasingly being allocated space to support organized parking and intermodal access. Space is being allocated to support mobility on demand again, at intermodal passenger facilities and high demand destinations and corridors. All the designing and sharing of the street space has risen to a priority for our acting administrator, Stephanie Pollack. We have a large initiative underway to review and improve internal processes to advance our support for complete streets via policy, guidance, new resources and training. And we will be working in partnership with state DOTs and local agencies to further build capacity to ensure complete streets get mainstreamed into planning and project development. Economic development plans and strategies often rest on maximizing access and person throughput to and around retail, cultural, and tourism districts. A productive curb can be a factor in revitalization plans. And finally, our collective arc towards more equitable transportation outcomes necessitates that costs and benefits to all users impacted by curb management schemes are considered and that surrounding communities are well represented in decision making. Significant stakeholder engagement is needed to get optimal solutions. This, is not, this not only includes traditional stakeholders such as commuters, local businesses, freight and our EMS providers, but also newer and greener modes uh, such as micromobility, ride hailing, electric vehicles, and active transportation advocates and providers. As we main, mainstream the safe system approach to reducing injuries and fatalities, designs, markings, and signage can all influence how people move safely to and through uh, intersections and crossing. Building national capacity on curbside management is very timely. The policy and discretionary program direction built into the pending infrastructure legislation could help inform, support, and reward communities. For example, there are sections that support increased complete streets plans, policies, and standards. Micro mobility is added as an eligibility under the CMAC program. And there's a new discretionary program to support planning and build out of active transportation networks. So kind of in any future scenario that we can think of, there will be increased demands and opportunities 
to better integrate curbside management into an ever increasing multimodal system. As it is becoming evident, uh, it takes a multidiscipline group to bring their subject matter expertise to the curbside management table. This document was improved by input from our Federal Highway Offices of Safety, Civil Rights, and Infrastructure. And now I will turn it over to our partners in the FHWA Office of Operations to share their perspective. Tamiko, please take over. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Sherry. She did an excellent job, which made my speech even more short, <laughs> <laughs> which I appreciate. Uh, so I'm going to stray a little bit from a written script uh, just because Sherry did an excellent job. So first of all, my name is Tamiko Burnell. I work in the office of freight um, office, which is housed in the Office of Operations within Federal Highway. I um, wanted to point out a few things on our diagram here. The diagram you're looking at is actually from page three. Um, in the actual uh, inventory document. Uh, the Office of Freight, we primarily focus on what is listed here is vehicle storage, which is parking. Um, why is that important to freight? Because freight stops at the curbside to deliver goods or pick up goods. And so we're always concerned with the parking capacity. Um, on another area I want to take notice is the local businesses. Again, local businesses are directly attached to freight the pickup and the drop off uh, of goods. Um, and then I'll, I'll also bring attention to the word freight because we are focused on uh, those trucks of all sizes. Um, but the interesting thing that sh uh, Sherry brought up earlier is just not trucks anymore, right? Freight is delivered in all types of vehicles, micro mobility, when we talk about bikes, when we talk about scooters, um, when we talk about trucks of all different size, regular freight lawn vehicles, or, or the shorter or van vehicles. And so from a freight perspective, um, our sphere of delivery on the curbside is getting larger every day. Um, other activities uh, I wanna bring to your attention is um, in terms of this particular project, this is a partnership between the Office of Planning and the Op Office of Operations, but it just doesn't stop there. I think Sherry did a great job of listing some of our other offices within Federal Highway that have also taken a great interest in this project and we'll be collaborating with on a continuous basis. Curve reset support um, from many US DOT priorities. Uh, safety, uh, of course, at the curbside, and that deals with safety of our vulnerable users. Uh, infrastructure, um, also uh, innovation is a big uh, research area for us when it comes to curbside management. Um, accountability, again, how do we manage our curves and make sure there's equity at the curbside, there's accountability in that. Um, and also just uh, looking at research when it comes to best practices. Um, Although packages have been delivered ever since the post office came into existence, um, we have just seen a rapid growth over decades in terms of deliveries um, and the time of deliveries and just in time deliveries. So showing noteworthy practices are important to us when it comes to freight deliveries. Um, the other growth areas we have seen is since the pandemic. Uh, since the pandemic, the, the average um, amount of packages that are delivered to a a location has increased phenomenally. And so this has really changed the game in terms of curbside management. I am so happy that the Office of Planning has taken the lead with ITE to develop this tool. And I think it's gonna be really useful when we look at planning um, for infrastructure needs um, and trying to give us some structure and helping people identify the different uh, data and resources that we need to do good planning on the curbside. Um, so, I don't think a lot of the changes in delivery are going to go away that have been created through the pandemic, and that's important to realize. And I think this tool, along with other things that we're developing, will help um, guide uh, our resources when it comes to managing the curbside. Um, other things that uh, we want to uh, get out of uh, research on um, curbside is looking at the useful uh, technology when it comes to tracking freight. Uh, the type of freight that is delivered, but also the different types of vehicles that are delivering freight and how do we manage to make sure that our parking uh, capacity is marked accordingly, our zoning, our loading zones are marked accordingly. Um, today, we have not just big trucking vehicles wanting to park in loading zones. Like I said earlier, we have a number of packages that are delivered through uh, cars 
and other type of uh, vehicles. And so how do we make sure that the parking space is zoned correctly and signed correctly and there's availability for all types of drop offs? The other thing we want to make sure is that um, when we're designing um, loading and unloading that we're keeping in account again, one of our most safety issues is making sure we protect our vulnerable users. Um, and also, what are the technologies and tools that we can use to collect data um, and to build synergies between the collection of data and the different technologies we put in our vehicles and on our other um, micro mobility vehicles and um, other tools to make sure that we're getting the data we need to sufficiently plan for curbside management. Now, the young lady that's going to take you deep into this subject that is going to really give us some tools that we can use today uh, is Sarah uh, Abley. So I'm going to turn it over to her. I thank you for attending today, and I look forward to your questions. Hey, and Tamiko, um, I've been asked to uh, encourage our participants to uh, throw their questions into the chat pod uh, as you as they come to you so that we can have a record of them and we'll address them uh, after the after the uh, talks. But yeah, take it away, Sarah Abel from ITE. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Abel. I'm the Transportation Planning Director at ITE and oversee a number of programs, um, including uh, curbside management for uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineers. So I will walk you through um, some content specifically in the guide and encourage everyone to take a look at the guide. It's available both on FHWA's website as well as ITE's curbside management uh, resource page, um, which we'll include in the chat pod a little bit later. Um, go ahead with next slide, Jeff. So part of the guide is actually intended um, to set up common common terminology across both um, multiple divisions within an agency, but also across the profession. So you'll see um, on page um, eight Roman numeral of the curbside management inventory report, you'll see a glossary of terms. This is really the first time that a glossary of terms um, has come out with regards to curbside management. And we're defining curbside management and as, as an overarching management program or plan, ideally both within an agency, to guide allocation and regulation of the curbside. Um, and the focuses should be around, around optimizing mobility and safety equally for all road users that are using the curb space. Um, we also define the difference between the curbside and the curb space. Um, to begin to di differentiate the allocation of the physical curb versus the realm on either side of the curb, with which Jeff Price will talk a little bit more about um, in detail later. Next slide. Um, so there's many different types of curbside management projects, and we tried to lay out the types of project deliveries, um, delivery methods um, that could um, be deployed um, on a curbside management project. Let it be living previews, which you see in the photo to the right there, pilot projects, which we've seen a significant increase on of during COVID-19. Um, pilot projects are geared towards collecting data to better understand the curb and potentially reallocate the curb more permanently later. We've got quick builds, which are meant to be um, temporary installations, but low cost solutions. Um, the living previews are kind of the most temporary. We're demonstrating something to the public to see how their behavior um, is, is going to function. And then we have um, the quick builds, which are, are low cost solutions um, installed by a DOT. Um, and we've seen an increase in those with streeteries, parklets and things like that. Um, reallocation of curb space for walking and biking um, during COVID-19 as well. Um, and then permanent installations. We encourage permanent installations to be based on data, understanding of users and uses based on demand at the curb. And then of course, field adjustments. You may not get it right the first time around. You may have to adjust slightly as you introduce uh, electric car charging um, uh, spaces on a street or you increase your bus rapid transit stops um, in a particular corridor. So those field just adjustments based on demand and need at the curb are very critical. Um, next slide. 
So connecting MOEs, measures of effectiveness um, to data sets is probably the most critical in understanding allocation of your curb as well as which type of project, which I mentioned on the previous slide, are, um, are best for deployment on a particular project. Let it be at a corridor scale, at a block scale, or across an entire um, jurisdiction. Um, so we tried to break down the measures of effectiveness, effectiveness were developed actually as part of ITE's curbside management practitioner's guide, which was released in 2018 that Sherry mentioned earlier. And we tried to build upon those MOEs, update them based on current, um, current uses and users at the curb, um, and also um, the different categories we know we need to assess as transportation professionals at the curb. So we began in this report to outline MOEs as they connect to data sets and what type of collection methods um, we should be exploring all around the overarching goals of a curbside management um, program, plan, or a particular project. Um, so this is a sample sheet from the report on page 12, which talks about some MOEs um, and goals that could be outlined um, for personal mobility. But we also cover livability, access, which includes ADA accessibility, um, safety. We know that um, there's many conflicts that occur at the curb, so reducing um, the risk of harm to any road user that has to interact um, at the curb. Uh, economics and freight, um, which Tamiko covered very well in her earlier remarks, as well as equity. We want to make sure everyone has access to the curb and there are not restrictions or, or obstacles to all all road users accessing the curb, let it be in a particular neighborhood um, or um, um, with just accessing certain services, like being able to safely get to a bus stop and things like that that's along the curb or having uh, plenty of space um, to park a bike if they choose to um, bike to work. Um, next slide. Um, so then from your data sets and your MOEs, you want to start to begin to understand data collection methods in your curbside management inventory process. So we lay out manual data collection, automated data collection, third party data providers and how you work with those uh, those private um, entities like scooter companies, um, uh, ride hailing and car sharing services to understand the demand at the curb, um, making sure that you have agreements as you're allowing them to operate within your agency, and then interagency data. Um, this can include uh, the most common example is enforcement or information about zone, certain zone parking uh, permits issued through um, Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, things like that can help you better understand necessary allocations for the curbside management. Um, so this is a graphic from the report on page 33. I encourage you to take a look at that page um, in detail to understand the different data collection methods and begin to think about which ones are your agency currently collecting, which are they not, how could they better collect more um, in each of the four categories as part of your curbside management program. Next slide. Then in the report, we begin to outline um, curbside management digital tools that are available um, to better understand the curb. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in depth a little bit later, but we did, provided an overview of current digital tools that are available um, to transportation professionals, either consultants, public agencies, um, researchers even, to understand the demand at the curb. And this space, I will note, is rapidly evolving. There's been a number that have come out or are in, in the works since we've published this report this past summer. Um, so some of the ones we include in the report are provided in a table on page 36, table eight, and it includes core APIs in the curbside management digital um, tool realm. You'll hear the term API quite a bit. Um, but this is all about data management and having a common kind of data structure um, in how agencies and different departments are assessing the curb. And then there's Cord Collector, which is basically an in-person manual data collection interface that allows you to input data um, manually into an app. Um, anyone can actually act 
access this app on their smartphone if you are curious um, to input manual data collection that feeds into a common shared system for if your agency uses Cord Collector. Um, Cord Driver, which understands loading zones and wayfinding to help drivers let it be freight um, or ride hailing car sharing, um, Amazon, uh, short deliveries from, say, Whole Foods or Amazon Fresh, um, understand where they can safely park their vehicle without blocking travel lanes, but also paying for curb space um, if necessary. Um, curb IQ was recently developed by um, uh, up in Canada, and it's a data management and sharing tool. Um, Inrix Road Rules is a, a program that's not necessarily just used in curbside management, but it's great, another great um, interface, which we detail in the report in length, all of these outlined in the table, and it's a data management and sharing tool um, that di digitizes rules of the road, um, signage, markings, regulations, um, and then Mapillary is also more of a, a automated data collection compared to a cord collector, um, but it also provides an interface for uh, crowdsourcing information, which we saw a lot actually increase during COVID-19 as a resource both to agencies as well as users of the curb. Go ahead, next slide. Um, so in the report, we also talk a little bit about how to layer the three, the data sets, the goals, the measures of effectiveness, and the tools that you're using within a curbside management program um, on how to use those tools to help manage the curbside at various scales and using various methods. So you'll see two examples here, which talk a little bit more about the inventory process at, or outcomes, excuse me, process and outcomes, um, kind of at a program scale or at a jurisdiction wide scale. So looking at variables, let it be time or space um, to understand your, your activity um, at a curbside um, level across an entire jurisdiction or agency, which is the table to the right, which you can use as a model for other agencies. And then also, um, or sorry, to the left and then to the right is an example of a basically annual report for San Francisco, San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency's um, curbside management program. So they report metrics to the uh, public about the effectiveness of their program. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about our curbside management tool that ITU ITE released as part of the FHWA um, project. Um, so this is our curbside management um, uh, website on ITE's website, which again, we'll share in the chat pod a little bit later, but um, it provides an overview of how to access this GIS based tool that ITE and FHWA developed um, to help inventory existing conditions at a curb, but then also begin to analyze potential treatment options if you are looking at reallocating curbside space to optimize curbside management function. Um, so on this page, you will see a curbside management tool user guide. Go ahead and click, Jeff. Um, and you'll also see um, a, a case study. Um, or a set of case studies. So the curbside management tool user guide, we look, we encourage anyone that is looking to use the curbside management tool, which is open, um, open sourced, hosted in GitHub. We encourage transportation professionals with GIS experience to explore this tool. If you do not have GIS experience, we encourage you to partner with someone within your agency in order to um, use this tool in ArcGIS Pro version 2.4 or higher. Um, um, and the curbside management tool user guide is intended to be a step-by-step -step guide. So we encourage those that wish to use the tool to read the guide um, page by page before jumping into the tool. We also provide these worksheets as an example of how the tool can function if you do not have your own data available. Um, we also have provided um, a, um, a sample data set in GitHub. Uh, if you do not have your own data, you can basically run the tool using our sample data set, which is a, po a project in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we've provided a sample worksheet for that project as well. Next slide. 
Um, so here is a visual of the tool download in GitHub. Um, if you click on the first link from FHWA's website um, under curbside management tool, you'll be taken to the GitHub website where all of the downloads are available. There's uh, essentially five tool components. Tool zero, tool component zero is the shared streets um, feature. The reason why we call that zero is it's someone else's API that we're using in order to function um, function the tool. Um, if you do not have shared streets um, API within your agency, we do also provide tool one um, and curb. You can either use curb LR, which is shared streets, or you can manually enter data if you do not use the curb LR um, or shared streets. Um, and then uh, tool component two prepares the linear reference correspondence to make sure that we're connecting the road segment, the center line data to um, to the curb. And we basically um, the tool analyzes the the data um, uh, um, for linear correspondence. And then the second um, screen that we just popped up here is in um, the curbside management GIS based tool and it's uh, um, it generates curbside management statistics based on the data that you entered what is currently the use time and space at the curb which you can see here go ahead and click again Jeff. And then tool component four um, recommends uh, potential treatment options based on those MOEs and data sets back from the curbside management practitioner's guide as well as FHWA curbside inventory report. This tool is not currently customizable to an individual agency's goals or MOEs or data sets, but it begins to outline potential treatment options at the um, at the curb if you are looking to reallocate curbside space that's those bar graphs that you see off to the right in this last um, treatment option tool component four um, so it can suggest to add a bike lane which may be a lower priority the weight on the bars which you can see graphically here but probably can't read in detail um, are weighted for suggested it's not meant to reallocate it's only meant to make recommendations about priorities to potentially look at. So there is still a human factor in this tool um, that is critically important to ensuring that the goals of your curbside management program are achieved in a particular project. Next slide. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff Price to talk a little bit about lessons learned and some next steps. Great. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate um, that conversation and you know we've been working on this project for over a year and a half but the tools the using the use of gis with this curbside data is wonderful and to see that last slide with you know the suggested treatments and then having you know a real world check with the uh, community or whatever is, is so powerful uh, and it really is an interesting um, observation but i'm gonna uh, take a step back and look at some uh, lessons learned here. So I've placed on the left an example um, of quantitatively visualizing the inventory of curb uses. And this is from an example of a typical block in San Francisco. And this is figure 20 on page 40 of the report. And I think that's a great visual start to some of the lessons learned. Here's what you want to have, you know, a visual representation of your existing inventory, and then that'll help you start um, where you would like to go, how the community is changing to deal with new issues. And that's what the report's all about. The curbside management best practices using your data driven approaches, including the MOEs for those project decision making. Uh, and you got all the speakers have laid this out and the importance of it with the different types of transportation that we're trying to deal with. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The report highlights the leading agencies and we didn't get to talk to every agency, but some of the leading practices that uh, Sarah's team was aware of uh, that are implementing this curbside management to deliver. And the key thing here is the safe facilities for users and look, trying to look at all users as, to the extent possible and to the extent we can get the data. Um, and, and here's a great example with my diagram on the, on the right, which is figure 10. I really like this figure, uh, Sarah. I think you took this photo showing transit priority lane. Doesn't matter which city it's in, but it's including bicycles. And in fact, the report also highlights that Federal Highways provided this interim approval for the use of the tra red transit lane as a traffic control device. So the, the transit lanes could really become an important strategy 
and a, and a priority for some communities and for some areas. But I think another key takeaway is that this report emphasizes that there's no one size fits all for these curbside solutions. Yes, you should use data to make better decisions, um, but no curbside management uh, for only big cities. You know, um, curbside management is required in, in large cities, but these principles can be applied to communities of all types, large and small, wherever there are curbs. And I think that's a very important lesson learned. Let's go to an, another lesson learned here. Um, talking about both sides of the curb. So defining curbside management should include users and facilities on both sides of the curb. In that bus lane example I just showed you, it's a transit lane. But we also need to think of what's happening after those uh, transit riders step over the curb and, and they're boarding and alighting and they're in the pedestrian realm. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, as our multi-office team uh, who was involved in this research, when they were reviewing Sarah's excellent um, data, we really keyed in on the importance of these definitions and curbside management must interact. Our finding was as, as a group, that it, we must interact with all modes and functions, but really on both sides of the curb. You know, curbside is the term we want people to be thinking about. As you can see on the shared streets diagram on the slide, we define the border area, which includes the sidewalk or the, and then the physical curb that separates it and then to the left in yellow, where you see the vehicles, there may be a parked car or a parked bicycle or scooters. Um, that's another interesting part, right? So where the curb regulations apply, uh, where you might get a ticket if you're if you're if you're par not parked uh, legally or what have you on the outer edge of the street. And this is where the, the travel lanes access this, this space adjacent to the curb, which is so important to optimize for our cities to function well for all the reasons the speakers have discussed. So let's elaborate a little bit more on the lessons learned with this next um, defining curbside management, uh, including all users in different portions of the right of way. This cross section diagram in yellow is figure 46 from the report and it's on page 72. It, it, the diagram is, does a great job depicting the different portions of the right of way that may be designed for use by specific travel modes. So if you look to the left, you've got the um, pedestrian realm and I, I this is idealized it's the busiest street you've ever seen with the most modes but it's really important because it helps us and, and thanks to Nelson Nygaard for the work on this and they've been a, a great uh, organization although they weren't working with us on this on this project um, but from the left you see the pedestrian realm and the zones and then uh, that really is an interface with the land uses and then you're seeing the flexible areas and there some of the uses there really important for, for some of uh, our different modes, uh, areas, and then the uh, vehicle realm as well with the bicycle zone and the vehicle zone. And then the median, which had, plays its own role uh, for, in terms of a pedestrian refuge, and then the opposite side of the street. So I think it's important to sort of take a look at some of these great diagrams that we've picked from industry uh, and the best practices. And it's very informative uh, for the current multimodal planning approaches that are being used today. And, and there really are some great examples and some great capacities out there uh, for people. But after you examine this diagram, and then you think about some of the things you've heard from the other speakers, you can imagine how these right-of-way zones might evolve by the addition of these new travel modes, such as the ride hailing, which is currently happening, or the micromobility, but as it gets even more, uh, more demand and more usage in our cities, how are we gonna deal with these increased demands in freight and pedestrian traffic? So how are these realms gonna change? And the report really does a good job of explaining how the curbside management is evolving and there will always be new technologies. We've already had 20 years of ITS uh, innovations that have helped us with our intersections and, and getting data. Uh, but we're going to see some of these new functions in the near future dealing with some, some things were previously mentioned, whether it's autonomous vehicles or e-bicycle deliveries. The innovations will keep coming and our agencies will keep adapting the streets but it's important to think about it from this perspective of the different realms. So that's another takeaway. OK, let's go to the next slide. Um, one thing I did want to mention is we have excellent resources available at Federal Highways with our National Highway Institute. One course in particular that I really like because we get a lot of questions about bicycle facilities design is our bicycle facility design web based training, which really helps design practitioners understand specific requirements for some of these new facilities like the protected bike lane, which you've seen several pictures of. So that's worth um, discussing. And also, as Sherry mentioned, 
early, our research is ongoing for emerging innovations, including micromobility. So um, defining curbside management should include an understanding of the travel demands uh, for all modes, including time of day uses. And here is uh, figure 43 from our report, page on page 68, which depicts the concept of dynamic, dynamic curbs, which is an evolving practice with the idea to adapt the curb based on peak demands uh, of uses and at certain times a day. So you've seen that in some areas, maybe a stadium area where the, the signage on the curbside is different for when there's a, where there's a game day uh, or, or certain times of, of the week. Um, curbside management should definitely include a comprehensive understanding of the infrastructure, the right of way, the network, definitely the adjacent land uses and the demands and operations, and even um, comprehensive plans or future plans for what's happening, whether it's land use or the transportation, to be able to deal with the, the challenges. It's important to have that multimodal network plan from which agencies can improve the network project by project, street by street, as the opportunities arrive to improve the overall network. Okay, and back to our last uh, lesson learned from this great research. Uh, the report helps us understand the curbside management is an integral to optimizing and effectively managing the transportation system overall. And you certainly notice that and with respect to curbsides when they don't run smoothly, don't you? Uh, the congestion, the delays that you experience. Uh, but one of the takeaways from the report is that curbside strategies can help the shared systems run more smoothly, as these trips are typically beginning and ending on the curbside, uh, including parking uh, for the vehicles. To illustrate that, I've got three diagrams here from the report. On the left, figure four, the transit service coordination with e-scooter parking from Arlington, Virginia. A great example, I know this area very well where you don't want those parked e-scooters in the way of the of the people getting on and off the bus. They've got their own place uh, in the curbside. Uh, so the users of the e-scooters know what they're doing. Very important. I think the middle uh, slide is very important. Adequate uh, sidewalk um, widths that are good for accessible users. Very important uh, uh, to make sure our shared systems, the most critical system, the sidewalk network is safe and including the crossings. And then uh, figure 25 uh, is the bike share parking off uh, the sidewalk in a traditional vehicle parking space from the Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, again, three great examples of curbside management that are helping with our shared systems to increase, um, increase the uh, overall effectiveness of the network. Uh, we can talk about some more in-depth examples uh, with the Q&A, but those are some of the lessons learned from the report at a high level. We can get into the details. I think now it's time to get into some next steps. Uh, so uh, we've provided you some information, but here again are the links to our uh, Federal Highways Curbside Inventory Report fact sheet and other information and our ITE curbside management resources. Um, the, definitely the tool and the user's guide are uh, worth perusing, or if you have people that you know would be interested in it, please let them know about it. And we want to hear feedback from the users. Um, We'd also like to uh, continue to hear about your notable practices um, and our follow up activities. So that's on our list of things to do. Uh, I just want to go uh, quickly over a couple related resources. Um, we do have um, Alan Greenberg uh, from the Office of Operations is working on a um, NCHRP project on dyna dynamic curbsides. We wanted you to make you aware of that with this report. He didn't have any project update at this point. But there are in the middle of the project, but we're looking forward to some interesting findings on that NCHRP project. I mentioned the National Highway Institute Bicycle Facilities Design web-based training. It's very good. It's just recently been updated uh, by my colleagues in the Office of Human Environment, um, and it's a, it's a great course. And we are working on some um, uh, upcoming Federal Highways research where we've uh, defined micromobility and we've got uh, a fact sheet uh, that's available and we're now working on some follow up research needs to address uh, equity and travel behavior and some other topics and really trying to understand who's doing what research and how that might impact the curbside and other uh, related uh, things. Well, we've got a web based active transportation funding and finance toolkit and summary report. This is to help for innovative funding strategies for bicycle and pedestrian projects and that's happening in, in uh, Sherry's office as well. And we're also uh, just started uh, thinking about 
the uh, the idea of accessibility and making sure we have accessibility with quick build projects and that's a, a real cutting edge um, uh, research that we've just started thinking about so we're definitely um, following up with curbside and we got some activities but now it's time to hear about what things you've been thinking about and i'm going to go to our question and answer session so uh, hopefully there's uh, a few questions in the chat pod and let us know your perspectives and uh, do you see maybe we'll put them in three buckets questions um, and then technical assistance uh, needs that you see and maybe valuable research or other notable examples so please let us know i'm going to um, just change my screen a little bit so i can see the chat pod and we can get started with questions Jeff, we do have one of the red lines um, that came in at 138 from Darcy. If you can read that one, please. Okay. I can read it if you don't, if you have trouble. Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Please read it, uh, Stefan. All right, here it comes. Have the red lanes been approved, and does this apply to green lanes? I thought these were only approved in pilot type projects i believe that's re in reference to the picture from san francisco that you had up uh, yeah uh, sarah do you want to take that and i i can get it if you if you can i believe that kevin sylvester from fhwa office of operations mutcd team is on so i'm not sure if we wanted to open up the mic and allow him to answer otherwise i can give a very brief answer is but, that yeah, currently Please do, and then if he wants to chime in, we can we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So currently, red transit lanes are an interim approval within the current um, MUTCD. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at MUTCD's webpage for the red transit lane interim approval. And and Kevin, we've made you a presenter, so you can unmute and respond if you have more to add. Well, and, and um, so I'll just chime in and say, uh, you know, I wanted to highlight that practice because I think so many times when you talk to, uh, I spent six years working with FTA and we, we really focused on uh, many aspects of operations and so uh, much delay has been avoided uh, and, and systems have been smoothed over by better coordination of bus stops, um, people getting people on and off uh, without having to pay with change and using smart trip cards and other other items that we really seen an improvement in transit. And that was such a great example of, you know, a dedicated lane. And it turned out that this jurisdiction was able to dedicate the lane, but then also allow for the, the cycling, which really worked. And we thought that, that the flexibility to, uh, you know, to allow some of these uses, whether it's an interim use or a full approval is, is really a good example. And, uh, and it, it's not just one community doing it. Okay, we've got another uh, question here from uh, 150. Uh, can you speak about or do you have resources on the best way to inventory curb ramps? I work for an MPO and would like to start a curb ramp inventory project. And that's from Jennifer Chavez or Chaves. Hmm, Sarah, have you, have you thought about curb ramps? In, in your work? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at doing a walk audit. So typically um, ADA curb ramps um, and just curb ramps in general, but also uh, the ADA specification for curb ramps are typically done through a walk audit. Um, I believe that things like walk audit should consider things like curbside management as well, but um, a walk audit would not. Um, I'm not sure if you're from a public agency or a consulting, um, but uh, would encourage the agency you're working with to do a walk audit that includes curb ramps and also including the ADA um, upgrades in that in that curb ramp walk audit would be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we could have done a whole um, report on accessibility and and the street environment and there's been a lot of great research. Um, I think the, the data based approach that you discussed that, you know, we talked about the equity uh, table for MOEs. That's a really great uh, place to look at in the report. Um, 
I have Daniel uh, Como question about dynamic curves and he asks, I'm curious if you have heard any tensions between changing uses multiple times over the course of the day and the com and the complexity of enforcing different rules, especially if you have something like overnight parking um, where a vehicle is remained parked. Uh, I think I got that. Um, oh, where, uh, where a vehicle remaining parked may impede daytime uses. Thanks uh, for your question, Daniel. Sarah, did you have any thoughts on the dynam dynamic curb? Yeah, definitely. I mean, dynamic curbs have been used for quite some time, especially through um, heavy traffic corridors. Um, I think that we're looking at, we've typically looked at, I wouldn't say dynamic curbs, but removal of car storage at peak times as a tool for quite some time um, in the in the kind of curbside management congestion realm, um, kind of in the evolution of curbside management and dynamic curbs. It's more about allocating rather than allocating an entire corridor for parking storage at a particular time or not parking storage. It's looking at where can we best put the bus um, the bus stop versus uh, a smaller, um, smaller mode storage versus so looking at it like at a more micro scale of of uh, horizontal across the curb rather than kind of across an entire corridor so based on peak times. Like right, if you have a major event with uh, heavy uh, ride sharing, um, pickups and drop off, allocating the space temporarily um, for those those peak events because obviously you don't don't need um, need those pick up and drop off zones at kind of normal Monday through Friday. So looking at basically connect better connecting demand at the curb to yeah. um, times of day rather than thinking about it from just a congestion management yeah. needing to remove parking storage to make a travel lane, which we've seen for some time in in this congestion management space. Um, so Tracy Scriba has a question from uh, 151 about uh, Sarah, how quickly can a curb be remade? And I know you talked about the different kinds of projects. She asks, what is typical or reasonable for doing the data collection, analysis, assessment of stakeholders' needs and such? I am going to answer it quickly before I hand it over to you and say, there's the typical thing that we've seen, and then we've seen the COVID. And we, we have all been discussing uh, in the different offices about how it was a great opportunity uh, when when people stopped commuting that there were less demands on the road. But Sarah, just in general, can you answer Tracy's question sort of in the in general, not in the COVID trying to deal with the problems of COVID? Yeah, I should mention that we do not have specific data standards um, with regards to curbside management. So there's not really a rule of thumb on the minimum data you need to con collect in order to deploy a curbside management project. And going back to those four curbside management delivery projects, it really just depends. I mean, quick builds and temporary interventions allow you to get a particular treatment on the street to then collect data to understand how people are using it and show should you make um, a red color pavement for, for a transit lane permanent um, or, or not? Should you uh, do a two-way cycle track versus a um, standard buffer separated bike lane? So doing those temporary invent interventions are actually a way to collect data um, versus if you're doing, say, a permanent project to a field adjustment, there's kind of no standards under other than those that our industry currently uses in order to assess that. So it really depends on the delivery method and which which kind of phase of a project you're in. Are you looking for a temporary or permanent um, curbside management allocation? Yeah, so we're getting some questions and I'm, I'm concerned that we can't get to all of them. But the one nice thing about this um, chat is that it will be able to record them and get back to you. Uh, but I, I did want to check in with uh, Sherry and Tomiko to make sure that there wasn't something else you wanted to mention as as it related to the research, et cetera. Sherry, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, I, I just really wanted to emphasize for folks to, uh, if they've got innovations, they're making progress, put a note in the chat pod. If they've mm -hmm. got a research need or a research gap, or they've got good lessons uh, learned to share, or case studies that they want us to look into, because we can leverage our uh, 
uh, quarterly new, uh, newsletter or our HE Digest that comes out monthly and try to amplify good information uh, to keep the national dialogue and best practices uh, being shared. Um, I also want to um, mention that uh, both planning and the Office of Freight have capacity money in terms of capacity building. So even if you don't have a noteworthy practice or something you want to share, you may be trying to implement a better curb management system. And we'll be more than happy to help with some resources, whether it be bringing people together, facilitating, bringing ITE to assist us in that effort. So we've done one out in California about a couple, about a year and a half ago, um, helping um, the NPO out in Los Angeles look at their curb siding, how they manage it better, and to bring in some other noteworthy practices, states and localities uh, to speak with the city. We will be more than happy to have that service for um, other localities that may need it. So if you're in need of that service, please reach out to the Office of Planning or the Office of Freight, and we'd be happy to assist you. Oh, that's a great idea. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, Sarah and I, um, well, I, there's an Emily Lindsay question about the Open Mobility Foundation. Uh, it, I, do you have time, Sarah, to respond to that one? I can re read it. Yeah, you. definitely. So ITE continues to work in the space of curbside management, even though this project with FHWA has ended. One of the things we are doing is participating as best we can in the curb data specification work currently being developed by the Open Mobility Foundation. I actually just presented uh, on their bi-weekly call on Tuesday. Um, and right now, our tool, we do not have um, funding or resources to update our tool. That's part of the reason why we hosted it in GitHub is you have the ability as an individual to post a patch essentially in GitHub for those that have kind of computer programming and GIS programming experience. Um, so we're hoping that Open Mobility Foundation does that when their API is ready. Um, and um, currently in our tool, it essentially, once CDS comes out, uh, it will have to be essentially in our tool entered as manual data. Um, it's not going to be plugged in like curve LR is just because CDS is not out yet. Man, you it sounds like you work for the federal government with all those acronyms. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. And that's the key point about all these tools and being able to um, learn how to save and, and utilize the data. And I think that there is a learning curve, but it's well worth it. And I think your work has really highlighted that. Um, we are at at two um, o'clock uh, Eastern, folks. Um, I I hate to put an end to the meeting, but I think it's time. Uh, and uh, please uh, let us know how we're doing on the in the chat pod and uh, any ideas for follow up. But uh, we are going to uh, record this and make this uh, recording available and answer your questions. So thank you so much for your time and attention, and thank you to the presenters for uh, uh, presenting this information. It's a big uh, report and a tool and a whole bunch of other research. So we've synthesized a lot and threw a lot of information at you. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating today. And Jeff, thank you for your leadership in coordinating all of us, internal and external, and uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to hit stop on the record. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>